So we are streaming live now on Facebook. So welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this exciting 10 day um, solutions webinar that uh, we begin on the 150th birthday of Mahatma Gandhi. So Mahatma Gandhi was, um, was so instrumental in um, in the freedom movement in India. And one of the first things he did was to convince the people of India to change their clothes, change their clothes from British clothes to Kadi clothes made in India. It's a simple thing that everybody could do. So it helped them join the movement. And they became part of the movement. And uh, so what we are talking about today is something very similar. So to, to get to where we need to go, we have to change what we eat. We have to change what we consume. So from animal-based products to plant-based products to a completely vegan world. It's a simple thing that, that uh, everyone can do and it helps all of us come together as a community. Come together as a community, come together as, um, as a world, as a vegan world so that we can then decide how do we organize ourselves? How do we uh, connect with each other? How do we create infrastructure around it? And um, so I am Silesh Rao. I've been working on this for 12 years and, uh, at Climate Healers. And um, uh, I am really pleased to have Jean-Francois, my good friend today here with me. And he's an expert at uh, collective intelligence at creating infrastructure. He's been vegan for longer than me. And I met him in India last year and we instantly hit it off. And I could see, uh, I, I learned so much from him. And uh, the purpose of this webinar series, the Solution Summit, is to introduce all these people who have influenced my work and then to have all of you join in and ask questions because you bring different perspectives than I can as an individual. And if you ask questions from your perspective and you listen to what Jean-Francois has to say, or what our guests have to say over the next um, nine days, uh, you will flesh out more of the solutions than what one person can, what I was able to do with these gentlemen, with these people. So. Jean-Francois, he has a very long bio, so I'm gonna read you a really short summary of it. He has been working for 20 years in the field of collective intelligence. And it's um, something absolutely, it's a new field really. You know, it's a way of formalizing what we have been doing together as a species you know, when we come together and work in harmony with each other. So it formalizes that this field of collective intelligence, he's been working on this. He has been working on um, crypto technologies. Um, he is the philosopher behind Holochain. So the crypto technologies that will allow us to create smart distributed organizations. And um, he travels the world to give lectures and talks with global leaders. So he's connected with a lot of the CEOs and um, government officials around the world. He advises different high potential startups that can lift up all of mankind or humankind. He calls himself an open source earthling and he operates 100% in the gift economy and lives an experimental life. He has been vegan. He, is a vegan, he has a vegan lifestyle and he devotes himself to liberating others from violence and the violence that we inflict on animals, especially. He's a happy father of a grown-up son. He lives in Provence, France, teaches martial arts and practices various extreme sports. Wow. <laughs> Jean-Francois, please welcome to this webinar. Thank you so much for what you're doing. And it's a pleasure to have you. Yeah. Thank you. So let us uh, start. Um, you know, 
you and I agree that we are in this evolution towards a completely vegan world. So what do you see happening as we get to this, as more and more of us become vegan and we want to see a world of non-violence around us? What do you see happening to the infrastructure of the way we organize ourselves? What kind of rules do we have? What kind of laws do we have? What kind of constitution do we have? What do you see happening? Hmm. Great question. Well, what, what I see happening has come from my research work in, uh, in collective intelligence. Very profound insights I've learned from, uh, from those studies. Basically, it says that uh, we become uh, what we become the matrix. We become, you know, the kind of matrix we, we live in. I had no efforts to, to make to become a consumer, to become someone eating animals in my past life. Uh, I had no efforts to become, you know, a dominant white, white male, uh, you know, in the Western world and all these things. I didn't have any theory or political theory saying those things. However, I did behave this way because I had some infrastructures around me that I did not even know about um, that would make me behave this way. And so I've learned in, in the field of collective intelligence that if we change those infrastructures, and I'll go deeper into this, uh, we can have, you know, most people change their behaviors uh, very rapidly uh, without the need to have any, you know, deep political theory about how society should evolve. But just because uh, the infrastructures have changed, then we can make amazing shifts happening. Uh, for instance, in the field of uh, currencies, if we design new currencies, you know, not the money as we've known it, that will always concentrate in the hand of the few uh, because of its, of its design, of its design system. And I can give more details about that later. But if we have something called money and that money concentrates in the hands of the few, then we have pyramidal organizations and based also on maximizing profit, and if you want to maximize profit, then you will have to do that at the expense of nature. You will have to do that at the expense of someone somewhere, uh, human population, ecosystems, and of course, animals. They pay the, the biggest toll of all on um, exploitation because of the concentration of money that we want. So if we design a, a different currency system um, that goes from the scarcity model to a sufficiency model, then I observe, I've seen that hundreds of times, you know, by doing workshops and designing currency systems, I see that people change their behaviors because they don't have to hunt for their scarce money. If you have a sufficient something, you don't have to hunt for that sufficient something. If you have a sufficient currency system, then you don't have to hunt for that. And that changes your whole behavior. So we can design new infrastructures and it can come from minorities that you know provide those those new infrastructures as a possibility, not as something imposed. But if we see that we have a better life there, why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you go there? Why wouldn't you you do migration there? Um, so what I envision in the next few years, I envision the rise of new nations uh, and including um, a vegan nation or some vegan nations. Uh, you don't need to have just one. A nation, not in the sense of a, a physical territory, but in the sense of people united by the same values and having the same infrastructures, the same governance mechanism, the same uh, currency system as well. What does it take to make a, a, a nation? It takes four things. It takes a constitution. That means a, a shared written document that names the values, that lists the, the core values that we share. So that we know how to do it. We've known, we've done that for a few hundred years now. We need a governance mechanism. Now, what kind of governance mechanism? Do we want it centralized? And then we go back into the old top-down um, kind of structures or do we want it distributed? And I believe we want it distributed because if we want to outsmart pyramidal centralized collective intelligence, then we need to have distributed systems because everyone becomes a feedback loop in the system. Everyone can contribute uh, in providing solutions and working on evolving the system um, as a participant in the system. So governance and distributed governance. The third thing we want a currency system. And what, what I mean by currency, I don't mean money, uh, but currency means something very different than just money. Uh, and I can explain that later if you, if you want. A currency system that embraces uh, and ha that has the design of the values that we want to put in the economy. Basically, 
a currency system that can only buy and sell or flow uh, goods and services based on the values of veganism. That means with that kind of currencies, you cannot buy meat, you cannot support, you know, um, burning down the forests and all these things that we see today in the world. That means we can make those currencies smart. And there we have to go in the cryptocurrencies, using them in a smart way. And the fourth thing that we need for a nation, we need infrastructures, exactly what uh, uh, we, we can talk about today. Infrastructures that mean crypto technologies uh, to make distributed governance, to make distributed currency systems, to make distributed every, everything, actually to move from centralized pyramidal collective intelligence as we've known it today and so far, to what we call holomidal, holomidal collective intelligence. You hear the root holo, holistic. That means a distributed form of collective intelligence. And we see the rise of that collective intelligence in the world today. So I see those things happening in the next few years very quickly. I see no reason why it would not happen because we know that the world as we've known it today cannot continue, no way. It, it hits the wall, we already know it. So either we have a downgrade and yes, we can prepare ourselves for a downgrade, but I'd rather work for the upgrade. And that upgrade can happen quite uh, quickly because we know the future does not come from extrapolation. It always comes from some kind of quantum leap, some leap happening, totally unexpected. And we can do that together. Does that Absolutely. make any sense? Absolutely, that, that's, uh, that's a, a great answer. Thank you so much. You covered a lot in your answer. And, you know, <laughs> You've been looking at uh, pyramidal collective intelligence, which I see most um, large corporations are structured that way, you know, as pyramidal collective intelligences. And they, uh, and you can see that a small group of people can actually influence the way corporations behave by just changing our um, consumption patterns. You know, when I see uh, Burger King announce uh, the impossible uh, impossible Whopper, or um, you know the uh, fast food chains are now coming on. Even McDonald's is is test marketing a vegan burger, and they are not doing it because they want to promote veganism. They are doing it because they are stuck, uh, because this small group of people around the world are demanding uh, vegan products, and so we are showing that we have the power to change the pyramidal collective intelligence around us just by changing how we, what we demand from them. This is exactly what Gandhi did with the Kadi movement. You know? so, and we are seeing that happen with the vegan movement. And it's about taking that to the next level. And, um, and as you said, building everything around it. So uh, tell me something about the uh, currencies. The, you're talking about the different currencies and how currencies can change behavior. Mm. So can you go into a little more detail on that? Mm. Sure, I, I can uh, happily go there. And also maybe uh, later, if, if you feel interested, share a little bit of uh, words about pyramidal uh, collective intelligence as well, which I think we need to, to address now. Let's talk about currencies. Uh, first, I should introduce a very important distinction between money and currencies. Um, money represents one form of currency among million and million and million of other currencies that we can design. Well, what do I mean by currency? I mean a set of rules, just like you know, games. When we you know, design games, we, make, we can make highly competitive games like the Monopoly game, and you have you know, one winner uh, in the end and, and many losers. And actually everyone loses because even, even the winner cannot play anymore. So uh, we call it in uh, the game's theory, we call it a collective death uh, game because the whole game stops. Uh, but you can also design many other games, collaborative games uh, where it goes on and on and on because no one loses. Uh, so we can also design currencies in a way that it, they become smart and they can integrate many other forms of wealth, not just what we buy and sell. Uh, for instance, you know, the, the biodiversity, you don't buy it and you don't sell it. And it does represent wealth. Uh, you know, the quality of water, the quality of air or human welfare or, or animal welfare uh, or education, you know, all these things do represent wealth. And we usually call them uh, wealth indicators, but we can actually, integrate them in the way we design currencies. So 
um, the meaning of currency has really uh, extended itself in the past few years, giving birth to new economics and new economic theories. Uh, and uh, we, we call a currency um, anything that represents some form of wealth in a living system. And more specifically, I'll become a little bit theoretical here, uh, a language of flow, uh, current C, C the currents, okay? Now, to get more concrete, a currency means any kind of scripture or written language that will represent some form of wealth. So, for instance, if as a community we decide that biodiversity, or how many you know, species we have around us uh, represents some form of wealth, then the numbers we will write for that do represent a currency. Do we buy and sell something with that currency? No, we don't but we do see it as a form of wealth that we want to integrate in our system. Um, your reputation on Amazon or eBay, for instance, they already represent currencies. You don't buy and sell things, but you can also already see that your reputation has a systemic link with your flow in conventional money. So you see in those platforms, in those conventional platforms with conventional markets, we already play without knowing it with two currencies, you know, one reputation currency. And if you have a good reputation, which you really need to have, maybe your biggest asset goes into the reputation currency. Then that influences the flow of, you know, euros, dollars, yens, you know, rupees, whatever you name it, you see a binding between those two currencies, a reputation currency and a flow of buy and sell currency. So in the future, we can design uh, what we call currency constellation. That means what kind of wealth do we want to see and represent in our living system? Do we want to see biodiversity? Do we want to see you know, animals and, you know, thriving and, and happy in the ecosystems? And do you want to see ed education and all these things? I bet we do. So we want to integrate all these currencies in our design and also um, one or more currencies to buy and sell things. Now, we have different ways also to design currencies to buy and sell things. We have the old way, the one we've known in the monopoly game. That means you have one centralized authority that you call a nation state or a lord or a bank. And today the banks have the monopoly on creating money. So you have a centralized authority that issues a quantity of money in the human ecosystem and they say, okay, you have those tokens and now you can play with them, just like the monopoly game, okay? I make it a little more simpler, but basically we have those, uh, those rules uh, at play today. When you do this thing, what happens? Well, it happens exactly what we learned when we play the monopoly game. The more money I have, the more I can invest, the more I can invest, the more I have, the more I have, the more I can invest, the more I can invest, the more I have, and so on. That means money will concentrate we call it condensate, condensation in the hands of a few. And when it condensates in the hands of a few players, then it becomes scarce on the other part of the human ecosystem. And we experience that exactly when we play the monopoly game. And so it becomes artificially scarce. And when it becomes artificially scarce, that means a lot for a few and more and more condensation in the hands of the few and less and less for the majority then that creates hierarchies, hierarchies of needs. And you have the exact same distribution between the concentration of money and the concentration of power. Pyramidal collective intelligence needs this kind of currencies called money to exist because pyramidal collective intelligence works on social hierarchies and social castes. And it has done that since pyramidal collective intelligence exists. That means basically since the writing exists. Do we have to do this the same way? No, we don't. We can totally perfectly design other ways to make currencies flow. And let me give you an example and I'll stop after that because I don't want to speak all the time. Um, we can create something called mutual credit, for instance, mutual credit. Mutual credit means everyone begins with an account at zero. Uh, so you have zero, I have zero, Deborah has zero, everyone has zero, okay? And now let's say I buy you, you know, five hours of uh, English class, let's say for hundred credits. So my account goes minus hundred and your account goes plus hundred. What have we done? Well, we have just written something on the record. Um, that means you have plus five, you have plus hundred and I have minus a hundred. And now I'll give, you know, let's say I will sell my bike to a neighbor of mine for 200. 
So I had minus 100 and I sell for 200. So I go plus 100 and you still have, um, you still have a hundred on your account and so on. So just, you know, people go with pluses and minus and pluses and minus just by doing mutual credit. And so um, do we have a central bank here? No, we don't. Uh, do we issue currency? Yes, we do, but we do, we issue and we consume currency based on our mutual needs. Now, of course, the, the first question that always comes says, yeah, but how, you know, how minus can you go? Can't you go, you know, minus 1 billion credits and, uh, you know, and, and take that uh, advantage from everyone. And I usually ask the people back, well, what would you do? And so we can start to design rules and say, you know, maybe it has to, we have to base it uh, to make it based on a reputation system so that your credit line goes on your reputation, maybe on your uh, social behavior or ecological behavior and so on. To make a long story short, we would, if we had to design a currency constellation, we would go into our values. What kind of tax system do we want, do we think as fair for the community? Who do we want to support? Who can go minus what, plus what, you know, one numbers and so on. And we would start to design a currency system, a currency constellation with rules inside that represent our value system. And then we would have our aha moment saying, wow, actually a currency system, a currency constellation do represent our values in motion. You see, when we write a constitution, we write our values, but in a static way. But when we design a currency constellation, we put our values in motion. That means they become live, you know, they become alive and it has really some uh, magic in it. I know I speak in a, from a very theoretical perspective here, uh, but when people start to do those workshops and just, you know, play by writing those numbers, you know, reputation, uh, ecological footprint, whatever you name it, just on pieces of paper with low tech, uh, they have those aha moments and they realize, wow, I don't have a scarce currency system anymore. I don't need to, be, to behave in a scarce way. I don't need to accumulate uh, you know, things on my account because the plus number or the minus number do not represent anything. Just like you know, breathing, how, many, how much air I have in my lungs does not represent my health system. How do I breathe? The quality of my breathing, you know, what I take, what I take in, what I give out, what I take in, what I give out, those flows of pluses and minus do represent the health, my economical health in a mutual credit system. So you see my point here, to make a long story short, we have the absolute freedom, absolute freedom to design other currency systems for buying and selling, but also for representing all for many other forms of wealth and integrate them in our economic system. Today, if I want to exist as a human being, if I want to exist as a citizen of the world, if I want to exist as a student, as a parent, whatever, I have only one imposed game to play. Every time I spend one euro or one dollar, it means I play the only unique game imposed by the few to the majority. In the next month and years, we have now the technologies in our hands so we can design different currency systems, that means we can start to create different economic, economic, uh, economic um, uh, ecosystems with our rules, with our values in them. And for the vegan world, that means in this, I will not have the capacity to buy or sell meat. I will not kill animals. I will not exploit you know, ecosystems and forests and burn, burn down forests and all those things. And that means a lot. Uh, so I want to stop here and check with you if it makes any sense. Makes perfect sense. Perfect sense. Thank you so much for that explanation. It, uh, it clearly opens up our minds, you know, because we kind of, we are born into this game and we think this is the only way to play the game. And we realize that there are other games you can design. And in fact, you can design those games right now and we can start playing it among ourselves and um, it'll be perfectly legal because all you're doing is changing our behavior based on these rules, you know, and we are free to change our behavior based on these rules. So uh, this, is, this is mainly what we are going to be discussing at the Vegan World 2026 conference. We're going to be working out some games that we can go and implement so that we can all start playing those games. Uh, and, um, and, um, funneling resources to 
to vegan organizations so that they can start growing their, um, their infrastructure. So let's talk about infrastructure a little bit. You know, this is, it is, um, it's how do we grow the movement as we play the game? And what parts of the movement do we need to grow? What kind of infrastructure do we need to grow? Hmm. Well, first, I, I think we, we want to start with what I call the myth. That means the, the story, the narrative, the world that we see, because infrastructure will, will flow from this. Uh, we can't go you know, first into infrastructure if we don't know exactly what we want. So what kind of world do we want? And I really think the first move uh, as a vision, as a storytelling, as a narrative between us, between all of us, uh, vegans in the world, um, would, would say something like, you know, let's move from a community to a global nation first. Uh, becoming a global nation, that means now we, we, we take the next step from a community, the kind of nice to have kind of thing, you know, the sense of belonging, but, but move to the next step of a nation, and that means uh, a constitution, that means a governance mechanism, that means uh, currency constellation, and of course, number four, the infrastructures behind that. Uh, infrastructures, that means not necessarily high tech, I would say high tech and low tech. On the high tech side, uh, we, we would talk about crypto technologies, and I, I want to say by crypto technologies, let's not reduce that to cryptocurrencies. Crypto technologies include um, the capacity to make distributed governance, for instance, um, so that we can keep we can play all the same games without the need to have a centralized authority or what we call the middleman. That means a few people in charge of controlling that uh, everyone plays the game right. We don't need to operate through what we call a, a server and client kind of thing. Because if we put all the rules on one server, um, you know, the agreements we have, who decides what, how the money flows or the currencies flows and all these things on the one server kind of thing, that makes it a single point of failure that makes it vulnerable to attacks. And that includes you know, governmental attacks as the, I would say the most you know, likely ones to happen because governments will not like those kinds of things. Um, but we, so if we use crypto technologies, that means we can create apps, distributed apps. Everyone has an application on his or her smartphone or computer or laptop that with which we can play the rules. That means, you know, make transactions in some cryptocurrencies or contribute to decisions, but nothing happens on one single server. So crypto technologies allow those things to happen. And that represents a very recent breakthrough, technological breakthrough, because it happens now. Uh, we have them now available today. That means in the next you know, couple of years, two to three years, that will become a very mainstream thing and a very a huge breakthrough for our species uh, to have the capacity to make distributed systems uh, completely operational and easy to make uh, and not the need to have centralized governments. We know that uh, representative democracy has shown its limits today. You know, if you, even if you elect people to represent you, that means you always have a, major, a minority of people making those decisions for you. And even, you know, well-intentioned and, and, and with, you know, skills and not corrupted, they still have a limited broadband. They can still make mistakes. You know, they have a limited view on the, on the complexity of the system. So now we need organizations uh, and that kind of collective intelligence called holomidal collective intelligence, uh, completely distributed to operate. That means some infrastructure. Also in the pyramidal collective intelligence world, you know, social pyramids, pyramids work because people uh, operate in chains of command. And chains of command can work because you have predictable people. That means people who will do exactly what you expect from them at a given day, at a given time for a given task. It takes a lot of training for people to become predictable. It takes a lot of conditioning at school for people to kind of forget uh, you know, their, their essence, uh, their true self in order to become a function in some big human chain. Now, from a sociological perspective, we do see the evolution uh, of human species for, you know, with lots and lots of people becoming themselves more and more. And that, may, that makes them not so compatible with chains of command. 
So that, that creates a rise of social complexity. That means, you know, highly connected, you know, people connected to themselves, to their true self, to what they really want, to the kind of world they envision, and still hooked into the pyramidal, uh, the pyramidal matrix. So how do you escape from that? You escape by designing those next infrastructures. And I said earlier, um, with the crypto technologies leading to distributed applications on the high tech side, we also have the, the low tech side. And the low tech goes into, hey, let's stop you know, eating animal products. Let's stop exploiting them. It don't, doesn't need any kind of technology. I can do it right now. Um, and so many other things. How we, can we evolve our language? How can we evolve uh, our social codes? How can we evolve the way we relate um, with our bodies and so on and so on? That also plays an important role on the on the low tech side, which we should not right. underestimate as well. Yeah, the low tech side is very important as well. It's where people feel like, you know, like I go anywhere I go and I meet a vegan, I feel like I'm, I'm part of that family already. I already feel that infrastructure is already in place for vegans to connect with each other and to, um, to feel at home. You know, the one thing I would say, you know, I, I would call it vegan world as opposed to a vegan nation because nation tends to have boundaries and us versus them type of uh, dichotomy. Whereas the world is much, the world, it, even though you're talking about the same thing, it, it is much more inviting. It says you are part of this. If you want to choose to play by our rules, you're welcome to come in right now. You know, there are no limitations, no exams to, to, to write before you come in and join. So um, this is the idea behind Vegan World, the Vegan World 2026, that within the next seven years, we can get to that point where everyone feels like, oh, I want to be there. I don't want to be doing what I'm doing now. I want to be there. And, um, and all the, the so-called pyramidal intelligences that we have today eventually dissolve into this new um, infrastructure that we are creating, thanks to you. Thanks to all the amazing work that you're doing. So now, uh, Deborah, can we, um, can we get questions from the audience? Yes, let me invite people. If you have questions, uh, go ahead and put them into, um, there's a Q&A box for the Zoom and on the Facebook group, you can type it into the comments. If you're watching by Facebook, type in any questions that you have and I'll be monitoring those. And looks Hi. like there's one. Do you see that one that just came in? Yeah, so Miles is asking. Um, should I read that? Uh, sure, go ahead. So Miles is asking that Piers Robinson, professor of journalism at University of Sheffield, identifies the propaganda machine is really what is ruling the world. I think it's important to regularly refer to it rather than use the word government need to be precise with language. Even using climate crisis is a deflection from the cause of the crisis, i.e. expansionary consumption crisis or other ideas. Uh, what do you say to that, Jaya? Mm. Well, it speaks a lot to uh, the work uh, that we do in the field of collective intelligence. Uh, and exploring exactly this, why um, do we have those worldviews? And that goes in the very fabric of our language, not just you know propaganda machine and, and how we name things in the in the world. Like when I say you know we have a crisis, uh, I can even even invent that because I name it as a crisis, and then it becomes a crisis because I named it as as this, and then I right. can uh, completely obliterate the causes or the systemic causes because I focus on I focus on uh, the the end. I focus on the on the symptoms, a crisis, uh, rather than what causes those uh, those things. And by the way, it takes a lot of efforts to understand the systemic causes of the, whatever crisis we we have or or the world today. I see most uh, people and and especially people putting lots of money 
uh, trying to address the symptoms, you know, let, let's build a school or let's have, you know, let's make clean water there in the, in the world, let's eradicate this disease. Now, of course, we need to do those things. I don't, I don't uh, argue with that at all. But how many people put their money in uh, understanding and treating the systemic causes? Why don't we have schools? Why don't we have clean water there? Why don't we have, you know, uh, a healthy lifestyle here and there? I don't see many people um, in the conventional world having uh, money, putting that money on those uh, on those things. Now, uh, back into the propaganda machine, um, I I do work a lot on the, on those words, uh, and I can give you an example. Um, I've chosen to uh, change my way of speaking uh, years ago. In this very moment, I don't speak what we call uh, plain English. Of course, I have my French accent and make mistakes as a, as a French speaker, but um, I do speak a different English called E prime, E for English and prime as a derivative of English. That means I don't use the verb to be. Uh, if you listen again to what with, uh, to our conversation, uh, I haven't used, unless I made a mistake, but I don't think so. I haven't used the verb to be, um, be exactly for this reason, reason, because when I say things are, then I can impose uh, to you and to everyone something that has nothing to do with my subjective self uh, as an observer. If I say, you know, the Americans are this, you know, the, uh, the men are that, uh, you know, uh, Robert is fly, uh, you know, my friend is this or not that, or was this or not that, that I impose something to you as a, as a view. And so it, it does generate social violence every day because uh, wars um, begin with the things, you know, when you hear uh, leaders in the pyramidal collective intelligence world, when they argue, uh, they always argue about things that are and things that are not. Uh, things that are good and th things that are not good, things that are true and that are not true, and so on and so on. Um, and so removing the verb to be has really helped me to move to a next level of, uh, of consciousness and by my own expression, because I don't impose things that are to you and, and to the people around me, but it also helps me um, to not uh, you know, describe the world as if I did not exist as an observer seeing it. You know, rather than saying, you know, Robert is shy, if I say, I met Robert yesterday and I found him shy, then I express something from my perspective with my, you know, opinion, feelings, thoughts, uh, observations, and all these things. I speak from the eye perspective, seeing or experiencing something, and I can offer it to you. And you may have a different experience and we don't need to argue about those experiences. We just have different experiences and we can build something called a perspectivism. That means you don't have one perspective, uh, you know, imposing itself to the other perspectives. We call it a perspectivism. So uh, I completely agree with the, this, uh, this comment about propaganda. It goes very deep in our language structures. Um, and we can totally evolve those things uh, in our journey. You know, removing the, ver the verb to be has not resolved everything. Of course, you know, language, French, English, Chinese, whatever, they, uh, they will always have some limitations, but we can hack ourselves. I like to, to give some conferences called Go Hack Yourself um, because we can hack our language. And then by changing some words or some ontological structures, uh, uh, grammatical structures, suddenly we can open to a much broader field of consciousness in the way that we, we describe reality. And I think it can help veganism a lot as well. And that plays in the low tech side as well. Right. Um, that's, you know, it's uh, great to see this, this perspective um, from you. Uh, it resonates very much with me you now because I, I've always looked at things as, as stories being told. You're telling stories about reality. And there are many ways to tell the story. I like to use the example of Michelangelo. You know, mm -hmm. After carving David, if he says, oh man, what a mess I made on the floor. And he's trying to clean up the mess with a hammer and a chisel. You're not going to get anywhere. You know, So you have yeah. to to change our tools, we have to, then we have to recognize the beauty of what we have created. Because again, that was a story we said, we were destroying things. We were actually creating something as well. So there's another question from Maitreyi. Um, 
Uh, are there ways to introduce these complex concepts at an elementary level where we are shaping the minds of the future? Perhaps there are educators who are deeply understanding this or gamers who are designing computer games for children to wrap their mind around these kinds of currency concepts. Yes, well, it, it always seems uh, complex, uh, complicated when uh, I talk about currencies um, because yeah, it has lots of abstraction in it. But yeah, when we play games, um, you know, I do lots of workshops around the world uh, with you know groups of people. So what, what do we do there? We first create a, a marketplace. You know, so on one hand, you have sticky notes saying you know what you can. Uh, uh, what you need, uh, what you look, you know, what you may want in your life, you know, food, shelter, um, transportation, fun, whatever, vacation, whatever, you know. And on the other side, you make sticky notes about what you can offer. So you just have a marketplace, you know, with offers and uh, and demands on, on both sides. And you put a price on the currency that we create that we want to play with. And of course, not euros, not dollars, not conventional uh, legal tenders. So we imagine, imagine a currency um, that we will use and we'll play with mutual credit. And so people just start to, to buy and sell things uh, using mutual credit, but also not just that. They also write, you know, how many miles did they have to go to, I don't know, buy something from someone. Um, they also provide a feedback and a reputation with one another. So that creates a, a feeling that they cannot uh, reduce um, something that happened to only a transaction, but they call it an experience. And an experience has a transactional part in a mutual credit system, but it also has something like reputation and, and uh, you know, miles and, you know, a carbon footprint, you know, very simple things that we can play with just sticky notes and, uh, and you know, pens and paper. And that just makes a game, a very simple game for people to experience that they have now something very different in their hands that we can implement at a large scale with each distributed applications. And that will need just a little bit of software. And we have this software on its way now today uh, through uh, uh, Holochain as, a, as one of the next protocols that we can use in the, in the future. So to that question, yes. Um, once we have the tools in our hands, that becomes easy. As one of the people who brought the internet in France back in the mid uh, 90s, and you know about this also, Silas, because you, uh, you know, highly contributed to making the internet something uh, accessible to, to everyone as an engineer. Um, you know, when I talked about the internet in the early days, from a theoretical perspective, I had people saying, you know, it will need, will need three generations before we understand that. And maybe our great grandchildren will play with those tools, but it seems so complex. We'll never see that in our lifetime. lifetime. And look at what happened. It went so fast because once you have the tools in your hands, you know, the interfaces may maybe not perfect. Still, we know with some bugs, or it's not so great uh, user interface. But when you have something in your hand, then you get into the, the flesh of the, of the experience. And that changes everything. So just a little bit of patience and we'll see those HAPs, the Holochain application uh, or distributed applications uh, coming up in the next couple of years. And we'll get in the truth of that experience. And we'll feel the potential that distributed applications mean for our human species, what we can do and how we can outsmart uh, pyramidal collective intelligence today. Yeah, uh, in fact, I'm looking forward to that. And at the Vegan World Conference, we want to define the, um, the HAP for, uh, yes. for Aquarius, you know, the new, yes. new currency system I've been talking about. Anyway, um, another question. And I see, and I see that you know, even in schools, when I go see my, um, my granddaughter's class, children love to play these games. You know, if you, if you just give them a game like this and say, go play with each other, you know, they, I mean, they will easily come to terms with that as the new game, as opposed to the money game that we teach them today. Yes. Right. So question from Miles, youth and elders are going to lead the revolution because the middle are for the most part captured agents of business as usual. Do you agree? Frank Rotering, economist, 
goes further and says the youth and elders will be the ones to bring the militaries on the side, on, on, side, on side, which is crucial. Do you agree? Well, I, yeah, absolutely, I do agree, but from an empirical uh, feeling, because I don't have uh, sociological studies or papers on my hand that can prove this. So, but from an observation perspective, yes, I do agree that youth and others, they have nothing to lose. Uh, you know, parents, and you know, they need to pay for the rent and to, for the mortgage and all those things, they get more entangled into the, into the current system. And so, but you know, look at what happens in, uh, what has happened in a country like France uh, um, last year, and we'll likely continue this year with the, the yellow jackets. Lots and lots of the so-called middle class, that means people having, you know, the entanglement in the, in the conventional world cannot even make a living there anymore. It becomes unbearable for them. And they see all this social injustice. And so we can also see more and more social anger at play. Um, of course, the, the people kind of protesting in the streets, they kind of speak to a father figure uh, called the government. So they kind of make a claim and not all of them think that they just have to build a new world rather than asking <coughs> something from the, from the old world. But I think that will, uh, that will uh, evolve. Now, something maybe we could um, say about pyramidal collective intelligence. Um, I always tell to people, advise them, don't spend too much time to try to convince uh, pyramidal structures because pyramidal collective intelligence means what? It means governments, it means administrations, it means armies, it means uh, companies, of course, um, middle or big size companies and other startups, um, but uh, it means religions as well. So everything, every organization, middle or big, so far has only um, uh, worked because of pyramidal collective intelligence. We could not run or administrate a big organization, a medium or big organization, other than having pyramidal structures. That means centralized power, a few people in, in control of the decision making, that means a labor division, because once you've made a decision, you have to break it down into uh, different tasks that everyone can accomplish. That means uh, a chain of command. And that means a scarce currency system that we call money. Uh, so those four things this define pyramidal collective intelligence. And I see too, too many people trying to change the government, like to have a new president or a new CEO or to convince uh, the, the companies to not do this anymore. And we can, we can have some results by kind of like external constraints, you know, like if people go in the street or they stop, you know, buying junk food and all these things, it will impose some constraint on those social animals. But those social animals uh, cannot evolve from the inside um, because of their very design. We expect from them things that they cannot do. Even if you remove the, you know, the bad guys at the top and replace them with good benevolent people, uh, trying to do their best, they can improve, of course, but they will also reach a systemic limit. And you see, for instance, uh, we could have, you know, the, let's imagine that France, <laughs> randomly <laughs> chosen, becomes, um, you know, completely uh, like the best country in the world. You know, you have full democracy there and you have, you know, people contributing to decision-making everywhere. And it still remains a pyramidal structure based on a physical territory as a physical nation state. It can't stop, it, can, it can't prevent uh, the, the rainforest burn, getting burned down, uh, Amazonia getting burned down. It, it, we need systemic distributed form of collective intelligence. And so pyramidal collective intelligence cannot embrace the level of complexity we need to embrace in the next world. So we have to go beyond trying to, you know, play on the election systems and, and to convince, you know, CEOs and uh, pyramidal structures because they can't do that as social animals. It becomes too complex for them. We completely have to redesign those infrastructures. So let us, let's not waste too much time on trying to tame, you know, those, uh, those tigers. Uh, we need, yes, we need to do things with them. We need to speak with them. I do that a lot myself but it does not suffice. We have to also play uh, you know, by designing the next world, designing right. the, the structures. And maybe one last, one last thing, because I feel aware of the, of the time. You said something about the word nation um, earlier. Uh, I, I consciously use the word nation 
uh, first, because nation doesn't mean nation state. Uh, you know, we can, uh, uh, the, the word nation has something just to, to name a group of people becoming big and having their own governance or their own culture, their own sense of belonging. And so we can see them as a nation. You know, we can talk about the Hopi nation, you know, we can talk about different forms of nation. Um, in collective intelligence, when we build a new collective, it, it works as a living system. It has membranes. Now, uh, you know, uh, an easy to get in membrane or hard to get in membrane, but living systems, they exist because they have a membrane. Hopefully I have a skin and not everything can go through. Hopefully I have lungs, I have a liver, I have, you know, eyes or a brain. And hopefully not everything, you know, not every ingredients or molecules can go in my brain, otherwise I would die. And so when we design living systems, we have to think of those membranes very thoroughly. Um, if we make it, for instance, too easy to go in vegan nation, maybe we can just kill the process as well. Maybe we want to think of some levels of citizenship, maybe not just a, you know on and off, not a binary kind of citizenship, maybe different steps so that you, you deserve to go there. You have to some levels of contributions to make in order to prove yourself as a good citizen, as a contributing citizen, as an active citizen, rather than just you know, coming there and do whatever you want to do. So living systems have, you know, their doors uh, and their walls as well, and it goes into the into the design. So I don't I don't care whether we call it nation or anything else. I really don't care. But we have to remain very aware of membranes as something part of any kind of living systems we we design. And currencies, the way we'll design currency, will play a big role into into those kind of things. I ah, hope it. Can be I understand. Thanks for the clarification. That that sure. really helped clear a lot. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, um, we do have questions coming in on the Facebook group. I recognize okay. that we are at a one hour. Do you guys want to stay and answer these questions? I think they're more specific or they're more general questions about the Vegan World 2026. Okay. Um, do you have time for that? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, All right. I'll start at the beginning. Natalie asked, how can we expand our outreach in local communities? Oh, it's, uh, you know, it is people to people. It is sharing things. It is talking about things. Uh, um, you know, we are in a system that discourages us. They don't want to see veganism spread. So as you, as you noticed from, you know, when we tried to uh, spread word about the summit on Facebook, it <laughs> looks like Facebook was was targeting just the people who don't want to see this happen. <laughs> we got like thousands, I mean, hundreds of comments, right? <laughs> right. And, and so it's clear that they don't want to see this happen. But yeah, it is about us. You know, it's, um, we, we have to tell our stories. So we have to spread the news, spread the word. Okay. So next question from Katie. How can I, as an individual, contribute to the goal of Vegan World 2026? I am recently living a vegan life at age 55 after attending a Prayer for Compassion movie screening. Uh -huh. My primary motivation was no longer participating in the violence against all animals. That's so beautiful to hear. Thank you so much, Katie, for doing what you're doing. And in fact, uh, we have uh, at the Vegan World 2026 conference, we're going to be talking about the four ways in which four types of actions that we can be doing to to help this process. So that's illumination, which is about talking about it, you know, uh, showing movies, screening those movies, talking to your friends and family about it. That's illumination. And then we have the protection, which is helping, uh, preventing the old from killing the new. So that's the protection work that needs to be done uh, to create the vegan world. Third is hospice care, which is helping uh, helping businesses that are dying, you know, find new ways or helping the, um, the process of transformation because then old is dying and a new is being born. So there's hospice care involved in that. And finally, it's, you can contribute towards trailblazing, which is what JF does, you know, which is about thinking of new ideas and thinking of new ways of seeing things. And and creating the new infrastructure, the new new membranes that we need. Um, so 
there are many ways in which we can contribute and you have to find what resonates with you. Thank you. And Jessica adds here, Jessica Lanine, who will be on on Sunday, adds that you can join or start a climate healers group. So join us on Sunday for that discussion about uh, how to do that. Um, let's see. Okay, and the rest is just continuing that conversation. There's the continuing that conversation between Jessica and a few of the people in the Climate Healers um, Facebook group. Okay, so I believe, let's see, is there another one? There's another sharing an idea on the uh, Zoom. The group of high school students I worked with organized a green teen conference every year and they would make it vegan. Nero, near zero waste, uh, event by design. That's awesome. Right. That's what we try to do with the Vegan World 2026 conference also. We try to make it near zero waste. Excellent. So, Salish, do you want to let people know about the Vegan World 2026 conference that's coming up? Yes. So, the, this is, a, you know, the summit here is a, um, a pre-event for the Vegan World 2026 conference, which is happening on, starts on the 25th of October and goes on till the 27th. It's over the weekend that we all get together and um, work on this, um, these new apps that we need to work on. So we're specifying these new apps so that we can start building it. And then we can start playing uh, the new games. So that's the goal of the conference. And uh, it's happening in Mesa, Arizona. And you can go to veganworld2026.org slash conference and register for that. Um, and it's going to be a working conference. So people are going to come together and work together to create this new specs. So, it, it, so this is uh, rather than coming to the conference to listen to experts, this is how we are propagating the words of the experts so that through the summit, you can actually listen to the experts first before you come to the conference. And thank you so much, JF, for your contribution to this. You know, it has been great spending this hour with you. I learned a lot. I'm sure people who are listening learned a lot as well. And you are, you, you are helping us make this um, flourish. You see, I can see the Vegan World 2026 just manifesting in front of my eyes now. Mm. Thank you so much, Silesh, also, and everyone. Uh, thank you, Silesh, for what you embody and, and carry and the great vision you hold. Uh, thank you, Deborah, for organizing this and uh, making it easy for, for us. And thank you, everyone who attended. I, I saw great questions, great comment. Uh, it inspires me. Um, it feels so good to know that we have a worldwide community. Uh, everywhere we go, we can meet. Um, because meeting other vegans mean meeting people sharing the same values of compassion, uh, of, uh, you know, building institutionalized compassion rather than violence, uh, making it as an embodiment, not just, you know, something to, to tell to the others, but just embodying the next world. And it has such a power in itself. So let's make it a global nation and uh, nations will happen because they have the capacity to build their infrastructures and basically their economy and their economy because of their currencies. And that we have it in our hands. So I feel so honored to participate with this global community and thank you everyone for that. Thank you. And I, uh, we'll work on the uh, technical difficulties <laughs> and figure out why my <laughs> My camera is not working, and so hopefully you'll see me all tomorrow. Right. I right. hope so, yep. Salesh. Okay, <laughs> so tomorrow, Salesh will be on with Jane Veles mitchell and you're going to be talking about the seven uh, key... The seven uh, core shifts, yeah. Kevin, seven. yes, I'm sorry. The seven core shifts that are needed in order for us to move to a vegan world, and I'm really excited about that interview tomorrow, so... Yeah, Jane's an amazing individual, so she's, she's a force of nature. I love to talk to her. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So everybody join us for that tomorrow at 9 a.m. U.S. Pacific time, and I'll send out a link to the recording for this shortly. You can also catch it in the Climate Healers Facebook group.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you for everything you're doing. Bye-bye.